Welcome back BioMonsters. Today we're going to be talking about cell size and the big question that we want you to keep in mind while you're taking your notes today and answering your stop and jot questions is this, does cell size matter? All right, let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing that we want to talk about is the fact that cells come in all shapes and sizes. Here's an example of what we're talking about. To compare cell size, we're going to start out with a coffee bean. It's a pretty large structure compared to some of the things found in, in living things. We also have a sesame seed, a grain of salt. As we're getting smaller, we're going to start to see some unicellular organisms pop up. Here's my amoeba, right, which is a single cell. They're a unicellular organism. My parasite, uh, I'm sorry, my paramecium, which is another type of protist. I have have a human egg cell, which is relatively big, then a sperm next to it, which is really small. I have a skin cell compared to those two things. And as I get smaller, I'm zooming in, I have a red blood cell. I'm also going to start to see baker's yeast, what I use to make bread and cake. X chromosome, which is just made up of DNA. Now I'm getting even smaller. So here we are, we have a um, E. coli bacterium, uh, which can cause sickness. We also have a lysosome, which we know is the garbage can organelle of the cell. We have our mitochondria, so we're starting to see more eukaryotic uh, organelles. Now we're starting to see even smaller things. So here's the virus, the human influenza or the flu virus, HIV, relatively small viruses, and viruses are much smaller than bacteria, which we've talked about before. Now here's another structure that we recognize, a ribosome, which is an organelle found inside of all cells, hemoglobin, which is a pigment found in red blood cells, RNA, which is the cousin of DNA, we also have a phospholipid that we talked about before, which makes up the component, a major component of the cell membrane. Here we have a sugar or a glucose molecule. Here's a little tiny water molecule. And then lastly, we're going to zoom in on a carbon atom. So clearly, based on what I just showed you, cells come in all shapes and sizes. And this video helps us to see how big things are relative to things that we commonly know or come in contact with, like a coffee bean or even um, a water molecule. So obviously things come in all shapes and sizes. And again, our job is to figure out whether or not those differences in shapes and sizes actually matter. All right, so now that we've got, we've watched that, and we know that cells do in fact come in different shapes and sizes, our job is to answer this question. Why should, why should a cell care about its size? Well, there are two reasons why cells should care about their size. The first reason is that cells have to be able to take things in from their environment. And the second thing is, is that cells have to be able to get rid of stuff that it no longer needs inside the cell. So let's talk about what these things are that need to be taken in and also what needs to be eliminated from the cell. Cells are a lot like the larger organism that they make up. So think about the stuff that you actually have to take in. As a large human organism, you have to be able to take in food product. If you don't take in food, you won't have the energy to do all the other metabolic things that need to happen in order to maintain homeostasis. This food generally is referred to as reactants for chemical reactions inside of a cell. So we need this food in order to power the chemical reactions that need to happen. We also need to bring in certain types of gases. The main gas that we're responsible or interested in bringing in is something called oxygen. And this is something that you guys breathe in. And it is the uh, chemical formula is O2. Now, think about things that you have to remove from your body. Obviously, you guys have to get rid of waste. The same thing is true for cells. We also need to eliminate other types of gases. So think about the fact that you guys breathe in oxygen, but what do you have to remove? The gas that has to be eliminated is something called carbon dioxide. The chemical formula of carbon dioxide is CO2. So cells have to be able to take in food and certain types of gases. They also have to be able to eliminate waste and other types of gases, specifically carbon dioxide. Now here's the kicker. In small cells, and this is really important, so cells that are really tiny, all the parts of the cell inside of it are near the cell's surface. And you guys should already know that the cell surface is a type of organelle or structure called the cell membrane. So small cells have the ability to ensure that things inside of them are close to the outside of the cell. Now this is important because we need to move substances into and out of the cell quickly. So if our cell got too big, 
the interior part of the cell would be too far away from the cell membrane or the cell surface and it would take too long to either bring stuff all the way in from the outside of the cell or eliminate stuff from the inside of the cell and move it to the outside. The term that we're going to use in place of this word quickly, because you're going to see it a lot on your test and also on the SOL, is the word efficient. So if we want to do things quickly, we also want to do things efficiently or we want to be efficient. So cell size affects the efficiency of the overall cell. Now, to help us understand that, let's talk a little bit about an analogy. So if you look at the screen here, you guys, if you've lived in Charlottesville long enough, you probably recognize this place. This place is called Reed's Market. Small cells are a lot like Reed's Grocery Store. So let's go ahead and write that down in your notes. So small cells are like Reed's Grocery Store. The reason why we say small cells are like Reed's is because the Reed's Grocery Store is a pretty small building, so it doesn't matter whether you're on aisle 5 or aisle 7 or what part of that aisle you're actually located on, you can still very quickly get out of the cell if you needed to. And it's also easy to quickly just pop into the store, grab what you need, and then get out. So everything inside the store is really close to the exits or the entrances, which means that if you needed a handful of products like toilet paper and toothpaste, it would not take you very long to run into Reed's grab what you need, and then get out because everything is really close to the surface of the store. Now, on the flip side, if we're looking at large cells, large cells are like super Walmarts. Now, super Walmarts are great. The reason why people love them is because they have everything that you could possibly need inside of them. But here's the problem. If you've ever been to a super Walmart, you know it takes forever to grab just a small number of items. So if I gave you a shopping list, and on that shopping list it had toothpaste, oatmeal, and toilet paper, where would you go if Walmart and Reed's were located right next to each other? Think about what we just talked about. Think about cell size and think about efficiency. Obviously, if you only needed to get those three things and both of those stores had those three things, the only reason why you would go to one versus the other is in terms of speed. So if you went to Reed's, because everything inside the store is really close to the entrances and the exits, it's really easy to go in, grab those three products, and get out. Unfortunately, if you were to go to Super Walmart, that's not the case because Super Walmart is really large, which means that if you're in the center of the store, you're really far away from all of the exits and the entrances to get into and out of that particular space. So for us, we always want to make sure when we're talking about cells that we have read cells inside of us and not Super Walmart cells because they're not very efficient. All right. Now you've come to your first stop and jot, go ahead and pause the video. Make sure you raise your hand when you're done to have your teacher uh, look over your answers to make sure they're correct. All right, let's move on to our next topic. So how does cell size actually affect efficiency? So we know that it does, and we know that we want read cells and not super Walmart cells. So let's talk about some of the terms that allow us to understand this concept of efficiency. So the first thing that we want to talk about is what is the outside of the cell actually called? So the outside of the cell is referred to as its surface area. The inside of the cell is referred to as its volume. So when we talk about the outside of reeds, we're talking about the walls, which is the surface area. And if we're talking about the volume, we're talking about the space inside. Now, here's the weird thing between these two things. They have an interesting relationship to one another. The volume of the cell increases at a faster rate than the surface area. That means the space inside of the cell gets bigger faster than the surface area can increase in size. So as cells increase in size, the cellular parts inside the cell move further away from the cell's surface. And you guys should already be thinking to yourself, well, that's a problem because if we want a cell to be efficient, we need things on the inside to be close to the cell surface. All right, based on what we just talked about, go ahead and fill in your stop and jot, answer the questions on your day sheet, and when you're done, raise your hand so your teacher can come around and check to see if your answers are correct. 
Now, to help us understand the consequence of a small surface area to volume ratio versus a high surface area to volume ratio, I'm going to show you two quick little videos. In this video, we have a glass bowl with regular flour, what you would use to bake bread or cake with, as well as a match. Let's watch and see what happens. So if you notice, as I'm moving the match across the surface of my flour, nothing is really happening except for the fact that the surface of the flour is turning a little bit black, so it's burning. In this case, my volume is really high and my surface area is really small. So it's kind of like uh, the Super Walmart, what we talked about before. Now, what if we were to reverse this situation and we were to have a high surface area to volume ratio? So instead of dealing with Super Walmarts, we're dealing with reeds. So we're still going to use the same um, products. We still have flour, and in here we have um, flour in a sifter. And down here we have a bunch of matches sitting on top of a, um, a pie plate. So let's see what happens in this situation. As we sift the flour or separate the individual particles of flour, we're going to have a high surface area to volume ratio, meaning that the inside of those individual flower particles are not very large uh, compared to the surface area, which means that lots of oxygen can get around it in order to interact with the flower and the fire to create what we saw um, on the screen. So what we always want to have, again, is a high surface area to volume ratio and not a low surface area to volume ratio. Now, how do we actually determine surface area and volume to figure out those ratios? Let's talk about that really quickly. When we're determining surface area, surface area is just length times width. It's a pretty simple equation. And the units that we're going to use uh, in most cases, it's going to be centimeters, so we're going to put centimeters, and then it's just going to be squared because we're multiplying two values. When we're calculating volume, on the other hand, we're going to be calculating or multiplying three values. So it's going to be length times width, and then we're going to add one more thing, length times width times height. So in this case, we're going to have our units cubed because we're multiplying three different variables. Now, let me give you an example. So if we were just calculating a 2D object, so here's my 2D object, I have my length times my width, and let's say this happens to be one centimeter and this is also one centimeter. In order to calculate the surface area, it's pretty simple, all we're going to do is one centimeter times one centimeter, so our surface area of this one side is going to be one centimeter squared. Unfortunately, though, cells are not flat, so we're going to have to ask ourselves how do we determine the total surface area and volume of something that is three-dimensional. So instead, what we're going to do, we're going to be focusing our mathematical equations by working with cubes. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a cube on my paper. You can draw the same thing in your notes. So here's my cube, and I'm going to go ahead and draw in the side that we can't really see using dots. so that we know that they're there. So this is my 3D cube. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use the same variable, so, or the same measurement. So I'm gonna be one centimeter here, one centimeter here, and if this is a true cube, we know it's gonna be one centimeter all the way across, right? So I have one centimeter, one centimeter, one centimeter, one centimeter. The problem is I wanna know the total surface area of the entire cube, which means that I need to know how many sides there actually are. So let's go ahead and count up the sides of my cube. I have side one here, which is facing the top, side two, which is facing me, side three, which is facing the right, side four, which is facing the left that we can't see. We also know that we have the bottom, which is side five, and then we also have the back, which is side six. So all cubes have six sides. So if cubes have six sides, cube, let's go ahead and write that down. Cubes have six sides, so we know that. That's important. So in order to determine the total surface area of our entire cube, we're going to take our length times width, but we're going to multiply it by the number of sides, which in this case happens to be six. So what does that look like? We've already done this math, it's right here. It's going to be one centimeter times six, and that's going to give me my total surface area for my cube as six centimeters squared. Now let's see if we can figure out or calculate the volume. So for my volume, it's going to be length times width times height, and because it's a true cube, I know that all of these values are going to be exactly the same. So it's going to be one centimeter times one centimeter times one centimeter, and that's going to give me one centimeter cubed. So this is going to be my total volume of my cube.
Now that we've practiced how to determine uh, the surface area as well as calculating the volume of a cube, let's see if you can go ahead and do the same thing on your stop and jot. When you're done, go ahead and raise your hand so we can come around and check to make sure that your answers are correct. All right, now we've come to our last question that we need to discuss. And our last question is, what is the ideal cell size? So let's go ahead and write some stuff down. So we know the ideal cell size is a small cell. But now we need to take it a step further. Why do we want a small cell? It's because we want things on the inside the inside of the cell to be close to the cell's surface. And you guys should already be thinking to yourself, you know why, because we need to get stuff into the cell that's necessary to keep the cell alive, but we also need to be able to get rid of waste product. Now the way that we ensure that is that we have a high surface area to volume ratio. The reason why we want a high surface area to volume ratio is because we never want the inside of the cell to get really big because if the inside of the cell gets really big, things are going to be too far away from the cell surface. Let's go ahead and look at this graph um, because this graph depicts this statement really nicely. So let's look on the far right hand side of the graph and you'll notice that my surface area of the cube is on my x-axis, the um, volume of my cube is on my y. If we look all the way over here, as my surface area increases, so we're at 600 here, look at what the volume is. It's at 1,000. So here we have the opposite ratio that we want. So here we have a low surface area to volume ratio. This is never what we want, so this is really bad. The cell is going to die because it's going to take too long for things on the inside of the cell to get out and take too long for things on the outside of the cell to get in. So things are really far away from the surface. But if we look on the opposite side, as we are getting smaller, my surface area is actually going to be a lot larger than my volume. This is what we actually want. We want a high surface area to volume ratio. So this is good. This ensures that the inside of the cell is never too far away from the surface, which means that we can quickly move products in like food and oxygen and quickly get waste product out like CO2. All right, now we've come to your last stop and jot. Please pause the video, answer the questions on your paper. The images that you see on the screen in front of you are the same four images that you have on your paper. It's just easier to look at. Make sure that you go back, use your notes to answer the questions correctly. And when you're done, uh, raise your hand so that your teacher can come around and check for correctness. Thanks guys and good luck.